Hello, Rebel Teacher Network, and welcome back to the Talking Teaching Podcast. I'm here today with uh, Phil Cummings, and we'll meet him in just a moment. Uh, before we do, just a quick reminder to like and subscribe and uh, leave your thoughts in the comments. I think we're going to have quite an interesting talk here, so any responses that you have, I'll look forward to reading and replying to them. Uh, Phil, hi. Hello, Carl. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Good to see you. Uh, can you get started with a bit of an introduction? Tell us a bit about yourself, your background, what it is you work, you're work, working in now. Sure thing. Carl, I started teaching in 1988 as a very, I was still in my teens, as a, as a history and cricket and Latin and debating and rugby and all of those sorts of things, which you can't believe at the age of 19, you're going to get paid to do. Um, within about, I guess, 12 years from then, I had worked my way through to become the deputy head of uh, two or three different schools and then was a head of school. And having spent my whole life preparing to be a head of school, um, got into it and decided I really didn't like it. And um, it wasn't for me. So I then had to think about what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. Um, was working with a, for a mate for a year or two, doing some, doing some work on the business, if you like, as well as in the business of running a school. And um, uh, out of that emerged uh, Circle, the Centre for Innovation, Research, Creativity and Leadership in Education, which we decided was going to be a cross between a research institute and a consulting agency. Um, because we didn't want to work with schools around the world um, uh, on the basis of I reckon we like evidence and we like research and we like to do both ourselves. So in the last decade, um, uh, we've grown from being fairly significant in Australia and New Zealand to having a footprint all over the world now. So, so my days currently are spent on Zoom talking with New Zealand and South Africa and Australia and um, uh, United States and Canada and the UK and Southeast Asia and, and a few other places in between. It's a little different from traveling the world to do that. So I've certainly enjoyed being at home this year and, and, and learning to make things work in that way. I've, I've got a couple of university professorships as well too. Um, and um, uh, uh, an amazing team of people who work with me um, and who really do so much remarkable work. Earlier this year, um, uh, uh, Adriano De Prado and I joined forces um, and you know he, he joined the team and out of that emerged a podcast called the Game Changers, which we're now into the fifth series of, and we just had 50,000 episode listens register on that, which was quite cute, really. Um, premise of that is that uh, premise of that of, of that series is is to showcase um, people from around the world who are being educational pioneers at a time when people are thinking, could we be doing something different? What would it look like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We thought it might be cute to to showcase that. We had no idea what would happen out of it and it's done really quite well. And then halfway through the year, we decided that with a decade of work under our belts, it was time to form, if you like, uh, a front of house to provide um, the, the products and services that have come out of our research and our key relationships. Um, uh, so we founded A School for Tomorrow, which you can find at aschoolfortomorrow.com. And we offer programs and resources for, uh, for students, for school, I lost you. Is he doing it? I think he's coming back. Hello, Phil. Yeah, where did I get up to? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe pick up again from the website, uh, the uh, schoolfortomorrow.com. Uh, you want to pick up from there and, and go again? Um, yeah, I might just take back. I might just take it back. So earlier this year, we decided that it was uh, it was time to build uh, a front of house that could provide the products and services that have been flowing from our research to a much wider network of students, of teachers, of leaders, and of, um, to help them to thrive in the new world environment. So that's what we've been doing um, uh, madly since then. So we've got a range of courses and programs and all, all, all of which is evidence-based um, and all of which is research-driven. Um, probably the most significant thing that we've been doing as a, as a point of focus over the last decade is the notion of education for character, competency and wellness, which we believe is the reason why you do school. 
that you don't do school um, so that you can prepare by doing things for the for another round of doing things and then more of doing things it's just that's a hamster wheel that's not education and education is about becoming it's about the person you were the person you are and the person that you're becoming and how we can all contribute to those storylines excellent there's a lot there i think uh we'll probably delve into each of those areas as we go along um and i'll also direct people to check out your podcast um obviously when they finish this one um <laughs> at the the interesting conversations you've had there um so uh i'm interested in the the earlier part as uh you said you dabbled a little bit with um the head teacher position and it wasn't for you um and i wonder how i wonder how many people that might resonate with um the sort of the dichotomy between teaching in the classroom and running the school and I think a lot of people might agree with me and probably if you don't now, presumably you did at some point that the head teacher, it's always desirable for the head teacher to have classroom experience and to have a background in teaching and uh, in, the, in the learning process with the students. And yet I think it will resonate with a lot of people listening perhaps that the people who most enjoy their time in the classroom perhaps are not likely to enjoy uh, running a school quite as much and there perhaps are two different characters or two different drives um, in those two positions. Uh, I wonder what you what what your experience was, why you didn't enjoy that leadership or that, that head position as much and whether you think that that is likely to be a widespread problem and that those are two quite different domains. Oh, that's a lot in that there. I, I might try and just, just tease that apart a, a little bit. Um, one of the things, um, Carl, is that, uh, about me is that I don't particularly like being typecast or pigeonholed in any sort of way. So it's any, 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 anything that I'm talking about here is really just, it's, this, this, is, this was my experience. Um, uh, I'm a really intense person. Um, I'm not particularly lighthearted, even when I'm being lighthearted. I tend to be you know, I tend to be full on most of the time. And I found after five years of doing that role of the head teacher that that was enough. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I felt as though that that which I had been uh, called to do had been done. Um, uh, I also found that, um, uh, you know, that, that the role itself required me to be in the public eye all the time. And I didn't, that wasn't right for me. And it still isn't right for me. As we were saying, just before we began this conversation, I have, I have two places I live in. I, I have a house in Sydney, which is for family and for, for work. And, you know, it's the headquarters for our work, as uh, our, our, uh, everything that we do, as well as, you know, friends and all of that sort of thing. I also have a place in Melbourne that I go and retreat to uh, where I am right now and I, and I write. And, um, and I think, and, and I've got time by myself to make sense of the world. And I, I think I just found that the, the role of the head teacher didn't allow me enough space to do both of those. I always taught, um, I still teach now. I tend to teach adults more than children, but I, I, I always teach. Um, I can't imagine how you would do the role of a head without teaching in some way, shape or form. Even those who's, you know, really only role in teaching is, you know, taking assemblies or in a faith-based school, taking chapels or things like that. That's still the classroom, you know, and if you, and if you, and if you approach it with the notion of an overarching pedagogy that's connected to your sense of purpose um, and by way of you, you, who you feel your, your, your people are and your place are, then, then that's your practice, isn't it? So it's, 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 I, I decided to stop being a classroom teacher and move into other spaces because I felt that there was something important for me to do that stretched beyond a classroom. Uh, do you know, Carl? Think if you think if you will, um, uh, in year twelve or year thirteen, depending on which which jurisdiction you're in, there's always a group of students who are leaders and who are generally speaking anointed as leaders. And if you think about it, there are some who are very very good at just at their leadership with the person next to them and their immediate peer relationships. And then there are those who are good with leadership right across their year group. And then there's an even smaller number who are good at their, their leadership with students of all ages right throughout the school. Now, which one is the better leader? None of them. Uh, they just do a different job. 
So, you know, it's if, if you want to be a chalky and spend your life in a classroom, great, fantastic. If you want to do get out there and influence policy and uh, move away from schools altogether and, and into a support agency, fantastic. If you want to do it um, a bit of both and you, you want to do leadership of a community that I think there's there's roles in and around that. What what I think is challenging is that we don't remunerate people um, uh, to allow people to make that choice. And I, I find with the schools that we go to now, you know, Carl, it's we've got 260 schools in our direct network that we support over the last few years. And you know, there's a couple of thousand schools in the broader network. So you know, when you go to schools again and again and again, you find people who, for the sake of ten or fifteen thousand extra a year, go into a middle management position for what they're not remunerated properly for it they they um time doesn't make it a, a bit of difference around that honestly it's not about time it's not even necessarily about remuneration it's just people who are trying to make ends meet and they need to get on top of their mortgage payments and so on and so you know they take on a bit more responsibility and actually they probably prefer just to be teaching you know so it's i just don't think we prepare our profession for that leadership space it's it's probably it's probably it's probably the first area of research that we went into you know we found we, we we've had two masters programs running and an executive mba program running now and, it, and we still run leadership programs we've got another one that's going to come out next year it's how, how do we prepare people to to lead in a profession that by and large wants to teach yeah yeah it's interesting you talked about choice there and a few other things as well that come that, that seem important um it does seem to construct a hierarchy obviously you know any leader whenever you're talking about leadership you're you're talking indirectly about a hierarchy but it does create this hierarchy of what seems to be importance um <clears throat> and it does it does give perhaps the the impression that you know moving up that hierarchy is the desired trajectory um as we might see in most other professions um but that might not be the case you know the classroom if you are a classroom teacher and if that's where you desire to be um then there's actually not much room for career progression right because you're in the classroom and that's where you'll stay and if we apply a model of career progression that we get from perhaps the more corporate sphere to the um to the school environment then you're kind of pushing people to move out of the classroom and up to um you know curriculum and then up to school leadership and then up to something regional um which is a career progression that that suits most domains but maybe doesn't suit the the education profession um and perhaps that hierarchy is, is a model that just doesn't really belong there and, and and we might be better off looking at it as perhaps the way you've just described it as different domains where different people might prefer to be yeah i think there um you know I, I i think there's merit in that sort of thinking um uh you know we i wonder i wonder whether we really did ourselves a favor when we made education public in that respect because as soon as we made it public we just turned it into another government department right which just ensures that we just end up in that endless bureaucratic mess um and you know it's and you know education was not public for, for most of human existence. It's about communities coming yeah. together. I'm, and I'm a very big believer that whoever owns a school, you know, the, the authority to describe the curriculum and deliver it in partnership with the parents and the students of the school has to be devolved as low as possible. Um, you know, people who are making decisions about what gets taught in the classroom, when they're millions of miles away, you know, yeah. that's, that's silly, isn't it? It's just very, very silly. Um, um, I think to, you know, it's, um, when I was a head, I was a wonderful assistant, um, uh, uh, executive assistant, and, and she, um, I was, I was bad tempered one day, because believe it or not, I can get bad tempered, you know, <laughs> and, um, and uh, uh, just ask my kids. Um, and ever ever was sort of saying to me, you know, you're not allowed to be bad tempered when 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 people come along. And I said, why not? She said, well, you got to realize that you have 20, 30, 40, 50 conversations a day for every single person. That's probably the most important conversation they're going to have in the day. And that doesn't 
necessarily make you per se more important, but it's there's a realization that there's a decision that you have to make. And on many occasions, that decision will have an impact on what person can and cannot do um, within a particular community that other people can't have. So you have to take that very seriously. Um, if you believe in yourself, that's great. If you believe in the myth of yourself, you're lost mm -hmm. straight away, you know? So, you, you know, that was a big reality check for me. And, um, and you know, I think it's, it's that lesson, I hope has served me, served me well over the years since then, as you know, you realize that, at, you know, a lot of people talk about servant leadership um, uh, uh, and, you know, it's amazing how many schools you go to where the leaders don't eat last, you know? And when I was in the army as a young man and beyond then, that's what we were taught. Leaders eat last. And if there's not enough left, you don't eat, you know, cause it's, it's, it's other people who need it before them, before you, that's what you're there for. And, it, and if you don't have that sense of purpose that you are there to make people's lives better, mm -hmm. um, if you have a sense of purpose, which is all about serving yourself, then that's really problematic. And, the, and if there is a hierarchy, the higher you go up the tree, um, bearing in mind that I'm, as I said, I'm not particularly enamored of the notion that, um, that uh, every, you know, any branch of that tree is more important than the rest. But the higher you go up that tree, the more you have to realize that that balance between looking after your own interests and looking after the interests of others becomes more heavily skewed in the favor of others. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that ties in nicely to, you said about the, um, the public model as well, which I want to come back to. Um, there is, I think you're right, it's quite common that some of these, um, the visions and the missions that schools um, purport to have um, are often not manifested inside the building um, because they are, I think, borrowed or handed down. Um, you might have, you know, the, the vision of a school that was instantiated long before the current, any of the people working in the school were ever around. And uh, we often see that things like this are not really being implemented. So this idea, as you say, you know, the servant leadership and the, the community practice and various other ideas that a lot of schools will talk about, um, but we might not see them inside because they have been broken down to um, you know, little more than than mottos and morals written on written on walls. I think there's something important there, and I think, as I say, I think it does tie into what you said about the the public model and, and and what you raised there. I know you're now very international, but I wonder if some context might be valuable. Uh, obviously, you started your teaching in Australia, um, and and that's where you're based now. Um, do you feel that the Australian model of education is is fairly representative of the standard education systems around the world as, as diverse as they are i think there are some pretty strong commonalities between the most kind of you know the most prominent ones do you think australia fits in with the traditional mainstream schooling model or is there anything particularly unique about it oh look the first thing to say is that um, australian schools on the whole do fit in with a mainstream educational model um, by and large, um, uh, uh, the, there are some distinguishing features. I mean, we have more students who are educated in non-government schools probably than just about anywhere in the world, really. You know, we've got, um, you know, I'm, don't quote me on the exact figures right now, but about, you know, just over one in three students um, across the country is educated outside of a government school in either an independent or a, or a systemic non-government school um, uh, and you know if you go in a major you know four or five major cities that that's getting up you know just over one in two students so we've got a commitment to um we've got a commitment to uh, different sectors of education that these days is is justified through uh, a rhetoric around choice that i'm not sure is entirely authentic mm -hmm. um, really what it comes down to is um, decisions by various um governments of various different hues and shades since the 1960s that recognize that the infrastructure required in our country um, as as the country grew in size just it's just absolutely prohibitive huge country small population which means that you know we we we, 
we went from having a vast majority educated in the public system to that larger number in, in the independent system simply because you know that that's what we could afford as a nation really we could either subsidize private education or and and then do quality public education at the same time or we could have a lower standard of public education and particularly facilities in that so we went for the former rather than the latter option obviously um, it's you know the debates about funding in australia is a particularly toxic debate um, as many debates around the world are now, you know, there's a, there are binaries that are set around it and people are pretty, you know, uncivilised in relation to each other. Uh, what I can say is that there are very, very few schools you'll go to in Australia where you won't see good teaching. You know, John Hattie, um, you know, the incomparable John Hattie uh, uh, would say, you know, the difference within a school is not so great as, uh, you know, sorry, the difference between schools is not so great as the difference within a school. Um, uh, but, you know, that... That notion of choice now is important to parents. So as I said, I don't think historically that really was the case. I think it was more about practical realities. Um, uh, was now, you know, parents value choice around that. And, and particularly the notion of a, of a faith-based education, that's very attractive mm -hmm. to a whole bunch of parents, both those who are secular and, and those who are faith-based themselves. They like that notion. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, there, there are great teachers and great schools. I think one of the things that, you know, finally, where Australian schools stand out is that we do professional development really, really well right across our country. We have we have that same um, uh, affliction that all teachers have all over the world, which is that we can moan and complain um, about everything, you know, way too much. And, and we can be negative and get caught up in, you know, a, a lot of woe is me stuff. But the reality is we do professional learning very well. Um, the standard is very high. And the standard, of course, is is not just the standard of the, of, of the highest performing, but, you know, the standard in the middle. So, you know, great teachers doing a great job all over the country. Um, education systems that uh, struggle to keep up, but then education systems always do. But uh, there are very few education systems left in Australia which are stopping people from trying to move forward. So, you know, where, where I am today in, uh, in Fitzroy, in, you know, within 20 kilometres of here, there's, you know, really some some superb independent schools but also some superb systemic um schools and government schools which are doing brilliant brilliant work and it allows parents to find the right community find the right tribe for their for their folk yeah good um yeah i think the the rhetoric on choice is is perhaps more often a, an illusion than, than than anything else i think that's true in, in a lot of different domains um and certainly what what I know of the Australian system and what has always appealed to me most has been the, um, the vocational side. Um, it seems to be where uh, the Australian system sort of excels a little bit is the, uh, the, the professional training, the vocational training and, and things like that. Um, I think that's <clears throat> something that I've noticed as well. Um, I think, I think Carla goes hand in hand with that very Australian sensibility about an egalitarian streak within us right. um, uh, and that's not that that's not that um, that sense that everybody has to be the same as each other because that's not what we believe in but the notion of a fair go is really really important to us so you know my mum was born in Australia and went and did a postgraduate in London and um, found my dad there at a cricket game and he, he got some runs so he thought he should marry her and then they came back to us they came back to Australia and, and mum always said that you know when, when she went to the UK, she felt as though it was a place where people would say, I can't possibly do that. Yeah. Whereas in Australia, we have the, we just do what we want. It's like, you know, you see something, you go, oh, what? I wonder if I could do that. Yeah, of course I can do that. Of yeah. course I can do that. You know, and it's, I think, so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a, bro a broader societal sensibility that goes hand in hand with really good education. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, I get, I get worried about, school systems which are all designed to identify the top two percent who are going to have all the privilege and opportunity in their lives um you know at, at least in in some places in the world where they still have those crazy crazy highly examination driven systems there's greater provision now for um you know some sort of meritocracy of of um you know um of of background i mean at least you're not getting just all the adult children of the bunyip aristocracy dominating all the places where yeah. you go but yeah. um 
but you know, it's, you sit there and you think an examination driven system cannot be what our schools should be doing now. It's just, an, it's antithetical to the world that we live in. Um, but you know, then people with privilege, wherever they go, some people would say I've got privilege, so whatever. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the difficult cycle that presents itself there, of course, is the people who are in charge are the ones who have benefited from that system and have every intention to keep it the way that it is because it's yeah. them and they want it to keep benefiting them. That's yeah, the, but that's yeah, the human nature, isn't it? Most people are inherently conservative. I think I find, um, I, I find where, look, where I differ from a lot of my colleagues in, in what I'm doing now, which is um, in and around thinking about what might come next in education and helping people to see that um, through their strategy and their leadership and their governance and their educational frameworks and through their performance. Um, uh, I'm a, I'm a very big believer in, in incremental improvement. I don't think that human beings do well under conditions of revolution. I think there's a small number who get very excited about it. You tend to find them overrepresented on Twitter. Um, and, you know, they get very, very excited about bringing about revolutionary change and radical change. Most people don't want that. You know, most people can cope with a little bit in their lives from time to time that when, if they've got time to reflect on it, and to incorporate it into this of who they are and then feed that out back through their practice they can do some things around it but you know all of this stuff about you know you know you don't remember you remember a few years ago i mean you're probably too young but you know there was the whole de-schooling movement yeah. you know that we're going to de-school this and and then we were going to unconference this and and you just sit there and you go no no yeah. most people aren't like that yeah they're just not like that and we have to be very very careful that we are deeply cognizant of the way that most people live their lives most people do their work most people expect their children to be educated and 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 so we need to be respectful of that and not just run away with a flight of fancy that says well we can do whatever we want you know yeah. chuck it all up in the air smash the system you know don't worry about the fact we haven't even thought about what might replace us right you know? i think you're right i think i think i um and, and anybody who's been following the, 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 the podcast and my other work um, will recognize that I think I have a tendency for some of that revolutionary thinking but what I've really um, enjoyed through the process of setting up the, the Rebel Teacher Network and, and this podcast and the others that I'm involved in has been sort of exploring that tension because um, I like to think about the, the possibility for big change and I do talk about um, you know how things can be replaced with something new but because I always keep a foot in the classroom, um, I also see the reality of, of how slow some of that change can be and the value of implementing these small changes um, with the intention of those small, those small changes building up to something um, big. If we look at the, you know, the absolute goal, we might call it radical. But if we look at the small changes that are being made, sort of lesson by lesson, um, as we gradually move towards and maybe never fully achieve that goal, um, you know, we see real change happening, um, but on a much smaller scale or, you know, much smaller increments. Um, and I think that the tension there, I think there's value to talking about the, you know, the wide eyed starry dreams of what education could be. And I think that there are some people out there who will go and, you know, build a school that way or, or write a curriculum that way. And it will have some impact in perhaps a small area, but the changes on the wider scale that filter out from those radical attempts, um, you know, they, the, the, the changes that affect more teachers tend to be the smaller ones that teachers can get on board with and try out in their own classroom. That's it. I mean, I love the idea of I love the idea of a rebel teacher network. That's great. Um, I don't know. I just it's, I'm I'm probably more on the shit stirrer side of things. You know, to be honest, it's it's I'm, you know, it's that 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 notion of finding the thing that is incongruous, or mm -hmm. finding you know finding finding the poor alignment, or or finding you know revealing the emperor's new clothes. Those sorts of things that appeal to me, which of course then just sets you up for exactly the same thing to be done back to you. So you, you know you got you got to wear it when it comes, and when someone calls you for it, that's fine. But you know I, you know Mao Zedong said a revolution is not a tea party. Our profession likes tea parties. <laughs> Our profession likes harmony. It likes a gentle life. Yeah. Um, and you know the thing that worries me about revolutions is that inevitably someone ends up against the wall getting shot. Yes, and, that's and, right. And, and there are pitchforks and there's burning barricades and things like that. And 
we've got the lives of children that we're dealing with here. And, and you know, we need to be, there's a certain amount of appropriate caution, I think, that needs to be exercised as yeah. well as as well as well an intolerance for bullshit. You know, that's, that's it's just where you, where you see it, you have to call it. Yeah, um, that's but, right. But, but that's, that's why I'm not a head teacher anymore. You know what I mean? Because I said it's it's gives me the gives me the capacity to to sit outside a system and to be a critical friend and to go, you know, this 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 thing that's occurring right there, that's not the right thing to do. It's not yeah. the right way. Yeah. Um, and 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 here's the evidence why not. And here's the research that says um, you could be doing something better. And here's 15 examples we've seen around the world in the last five years of a different ways you could be doing it. So just in case anybody thinks it's all about Phil, it's really not about Phil. It's just it's just about being a conduit for providing, you know, thought about what might be better ways of doing it. And then a constant nagging presence and perhaps a slight smile playing around my, 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 my face yeah. you know, when, when people cling to something that's untenable. Yeah, no, maybe I, I, or maybe I get grumpy every now and then too, you know. Yeah, no, my idea of the Rebel Teacher Network is quite similar. And in fact, the, even even the name and, and some of the early uh, thought around it was more focused on that idea that you know, we, I'm, we want it to be an inclusive movement. Um, and as you say, you know, the idea of revolution, which is a, a term I sort of avoided early on, and and, and I stick with the rebel, the, the rebellion, and the, the rebel approach because. We're trying to um, bring as many people into the fold as possible, you know, and get as many people on board as possible, and not turn it into something that is um, conflict-oriented. Uh, we're not—it's not a witch hunt, you know. If we find people who are doing things the way that we perhaps think need to be updated, then the idea is not to kick them out, but to bring them in and and, and you know maybe see how we can uh, incorporate models together. Um, and I think that that brings us quite nicely to perhaps the next stage of your um, journey, progression, career. Um, and when you decided to move into kind of doing your own thing and especially the, the research drive there, what were the first, uh, the first areas of research, the first things that you looked into, the first changes that you felt strongly about that drove you into that different direction? Look, there are probably four areas that we've looked at significantly over over the time. The first uh, area was that of leadership, and and um, I became frustrated by the number of people talking about servant leadership, and the fact that still all there really was was the sort of short article Robert Greenleaf had written um, back in 1977, but not, nothing profound right. that was in writing. You know, there was sort of stuff that got handed on through some sort of quasi secret network of handshakes and so on about this and that and the other but you know beyond sort of being a good bloke and and being nice to other people there wasn't really anything profound about what that servant leadership might look like and in particular I got irritated about the fact that part of part of real leadership is that you have to challenge people so we, what we, was happening was we were being prepared with a dichotomy that said that if you challenge people to grow um, which makes them uncomfortable at first, because it must make them uncomfortable at first. Then you were heartless, compassionate, bureaucratic, change for change sakes, all of those sorts of things, which is just, it's just a nonsense. But it fit very nicely within that, that sort of very reductionist um, opposite view of must respect all teachers at all times, can't challenge them to do anything, must trust them absolutely implicitly, no review, no scrutiny of the profession. I mean, it's just garbage. There's no human being who performs well under those circumstances. And we've known that for over a century now. You know, there has to be something complementary around the idea of a community of inquiry and practice. So that, I guess that was the first area that I was interested in. The second area um, um, with my longtime colleague, Bradley Adams, Brad Adams, who's a, a wonderful uh, a Canadian educator and was he was the uh, executive director of the International Boys School Coalition. And we're in the city of London Boys School in in 2011, on a rather hot day, um, and we were listening to um, Boris, Boris Johnson, yeah. um, who, who rode in, of course, on his Boris bike, and then just let fly with 40 minutes of the most entertaining, frustrating, idiosyncratic stuff about what an education for character might mean. And it was all garbage. Yeah. You know, it's just all mixed up and jumbled and, you know, all of those sorts of things. And, and there are these 
very, very senior educators from around the world who are walking out of the room afterwards saying, oh, yes, of course we do that. Oh, of course we do it. And Brad and I just looked at each other and just went, oh, that's bullshit. That's, <laughs> you know, how would they know? And what we realized was that there was this tremendously important area of practice where there was no um, understanding whatsoever about what an education for character might look like as a deliberate target and intentional thing, and then how you might measure it. So we've spent eight years since then um, uh, researching on that. We have the largest single research program going in the world around it. We've got an international one, one in New Zealand and one in South Africa, um, which sort of brings all of that together. We've published on it in several different fora. We've written courses on it and so on. Uh, the third, third area is around is what to do with that. And that's, and, and that becomes this notion of a whole education for character competency and wellness, and in particular, the pedagogies that work well within that. So again, people were talking about relationship and saying relationships are very important. And that's a bit like saying, you know, um, you know, coffee's a good drink. You know, it's a motherhood statement. It's obvious, isn't it? Like, you know, it's us people who say values and relationships are very important in education. You sit there and go, you know, yabba dabba do, Fred Flintstone, tell me something, you know, it's, it's um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, quotes, quotes, I hate quotes, tell me what you know. And what we, what we learned was that very few people knew yeah. about how values and how relationships were formed and how they operated to develop the character and competency and wellness of students, how you prepared um, students for the competencies they need to thrive in the world, how you can equip them with adaptive expertise and self-efficacy, how you can then create a relationship, which we call character apprenticeship, which operates everywhere within a learning environment, which helps progress all these sorts of things forward. And, and, and where, where you and I came into contact was in a discussion which sort of hung on the end of that, which was about, um, which was about uh, um, uh, experiential learning because you know and short of Kolb's original sketch around what an experiential learning cycle meant there's nothing of any substance whatsoever there's mm -hmm. you know there's Kurt Hahn and his sort of quasi mystical stuff from the 1930s saying it's good to get boys out in you know in nature but then you know he also believed that it was good for boys to bully each other systematically and good to give them cold showers only and deprive them of of, of the love and comfort of a relationship with their families so why would you believe anything Kurt Hahn said? You know, he's just a bully as far as I'm concerned. Well-intentioned, but just a bully. Um, uh, so, you know, you, you, you look at all of that sort of stuff and you say, there must be a way of doing that. So that and a few other different things, we've sort of done some research and developed some models on. There are two other areas that we're interested in, one of which is around, I'm really interested in governance, but nobody else is, so I won't bore anybody with information about that now. Um, and I'm really interested in the notion of performance and high performance. Um, there's a side piece that I've been working on for 25 years, which is about Indigenous education and First Nations perspectives and how you build those into what you do and so on. But I'd, I'd rather talk about that another day because it actually that's that's a whole conversation. As I say, I, I wonder if we could maybe come back another time and, and, and perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that'd be. Yeah, that, that, would that, love to. Be, sometime next sometime next year, there's a piece of there's a piece we're working on at the moment that I'd love to be able to talk about in a few months from now. I'd, I'd be interested in that definitely. Good. Um, I want to come back to some of the things you just said about relationship, because this has been playing on my mind a bit lately. Um, I think that there's, you mentioned Twitter earlier as well, and, and sort of, you know, the, the edu Twitter and, and the, the kind of social media education movements. Um, I think one problem is you can go a long way in the current climate by, with, with the right collection of epithets, you can get away with just kind of uh, spouting off a few quotes and a few kind of flowery little notions about relationships. Um, and you get a lot of- and, and, and by stealing other people's work as well too. You can do that too. <laughs> yeah. Twitter, the, and the, Twitter, the, the Twitterverse is absolutely right with that sort of, yeah. that sort of academic dishonesty. Right, exactly. So I, I found that this, this, this idea about relationships, um, I mean, as you say, you know, we all enjoy coffee or certainly I do um, you know you're not you're not kind of winning any points or, or, or saying anything particularly profound by pointing that out and I've come up against a fair amount of um, confrontation around this idea of relationships by pointing out the same kind of thing okay look we all <laughs> know that that's true there's not a teacher on earth that thinks relationships are unimportant there are even even though we see different ways that teachers invest in them um, and we and, and I think there are teachers who think that you know relationships are not particularly important in the um, the instructional model? 
you know, I think there are teachers who think, no, my job is to teach, not to develop relationships. I think that that's true. Um, and but but I, I also think that even those teachers would not say um, the relationship is of, of zero importance. You know, if my students hate me, that's fine. I don't think there are any teachers that would that would take that position. So I tried to, you know, in a number of conversations and uh, kind of get into the, the depths of what teachers really mean, uh, you know, these particularly vocal teachers on Twitter and things like that, what they really mean and what it is they're really talking about and how that that's put into practice and found that it was often quite empty. It didn't really mean anything other than, well, I've said it and it, it got a lot of likes and a lot of retweets. Um, but the, the idea of relationship, uh, from, I, I find, should be an integrated idea where what I've seen lately is more and more people talk about the primacy of relationships almost as something that replaces a lot of what we might have, what we might consider of educational goals. Uh, the relationship seems to um, kind of replace learning in a lot of cases. You know, oh, as long as my students are happy, as long as I have a relationship with them, nothing else matters. Um, seems to be. I don't know when I say that it seems so obviously flawed, but it seems to be something that a lot of people are hanging on at the moment um, and, and kind of letting the real learning goals that we might want to focus on uh, fall to the wayside as long as we're building relationships. Okay, so let me pick you, let me, let me, let me, let me pick up on a couple of different things there and, and, and note that um, being a contrarian um, and being slightly skeptical is a great starting point for social, any sort of social science research, particularly in education. Um, um, so, so bravo for, um, bravo for sort of raising an eyebrow um, at stuff that you look at and you, you can't see the substance with. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Adriano De Prado is, is tremendous when it comes to um, making Twitter work with substance. Um, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of people who, who really can do it. Um, the problem is that there's also a whole bunch who don't. But then if you look at the way in which we've traditionally taught and traditionally connected with each other professionally, you know, there were, there were rusted on dinosaurs, if you can have a rusted on dinosaur, but let, allow me to mix my metaphors for a moment. There were rusted on dinosaurs who I started working with um, back in the dark ages. And, you know, they would pride themselves on not doing any professional learning whatsoever. What would you want to go and do professional learning for? Blah, 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 blah. Um, so, you know, I think you're going to find, I think you're going to find um, specious um, folk hanging around in a whole lot of places. Um, uh, you know, first thing that people are going to, first thing that people will naturally do when, you know, they sort of, when, when we might go into a school is, is look, at us, look at us cautiously. I, I, I welcome that opportunity because you sit there and go, okay, you've got to prove your worth. You've got to do that. You've got to earn your place, as we would say, you know, it's, that's the second cycle on the pathway to excellence, earn your place. You know, you, you, every, you've got to do that. And if you don't enjoy doing it, then you're just an entitled, presumptuous person. And, and lots of those people have plagued our profession as well too, really uppity people who think, you know, I'm the teacher, I'm undervalued, I'm underpaid, you know, you should respect me automatically, blah, 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 blah. And they've just got fragile egos and, 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 and uh, a gross sense of self-importance that comes with the fact that they're 30 or 40 years older than the, than the students they're working with. So they use their sort of um, institutional and chronological power to assert themselves and they're, they're just not used to being questioned. So let's pop them to one side for a moment. Um, uh, I think that um, I, I kind of want, with the relationship thing, I kind of want to talk about the character research that we've done. So if I, if, Indulge me for a moment. I'll walk you through a little bit of it. It won't take too long. And then uh, there's a real point to it. So when we look at character, we, we see a multi-dimensional thing. It's a complex thing. You know, some people come up with a simple answer. You know, character is what you do when other people are not looking. Not true. A part of character is that, but a part of character is also what you do when people are looking. You know, it's, it's, you know there's, there's a range of different things. Sort of. Character is how you live your life. It's about how you apply your um, adaptive expertise, your self-efficacy, how you live out your purpose, how you thrive. Three types of character, civic character, which is about um, belonging. And, and that's things like respect and civility and consideration for others and your, your place within a community. Second type of character is performance character. That's about how you fulfill your potential. And that's things like purpose and persistence and reflection. And then the third type of character is moral character, which is about trying to do what is good and right in your life. And that's typically connected by communities 
um, uh, to honesty, courage, and humility. So these these sorts of definitions that I'm offering are, are coming from school communities all around the world. This isn't some sort of pronouncement on high um, about you know a certain set of virtues that uh, you know inherently we think are superior. This is just this is sort of reporting out what people think. Let's start with an assumption. It all starts with belonging. If you belong then you're more likely to achieve your potential. If you belong and achieve your potential, you are more likely to do that which is good and right in your world. So three sentences, eight years of worth of research. There it is. Um, so what is the purpose of relationship? The purpose of relationship, number one, is to help you to belong. Mm -hmm. Secondly, to help you to develop your potential. And thirdly, to take that sense of belonging and that potential and apply it in the world in such a fashion that you do good and right to other people. That's what it's all about. So to those people who, who say, you know, it's all about relationship and just being, you know, lovely and happy and peace, love and mung beans with the kids, man, those guys were around when I was a young teacher as well too. You know, it's sort of, that they, they, they just missed the point and they've always missed the point because for them, it's about that warm bath of loveliness that they experience when people love them and they probably get nice presents at the end of the year. Yeah. I'm not sure how much learning's going on. Right. Um, that, yeah, that's my take on it. You know, you know, everybody who learns needs to move through that cycle of, you know, Con unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence to conscious competence and and there are some challenging things that have to be done along the way um, uh, around that and if you're not prepared you need to be able to inspire to challenge and to support in equal measures you need to understand that the the secret sources as my colleague brad sort of christened when we started doing this sort of work is the notion of creating pathways to success of kinship bonds um, and of higher operations around there so you've got to do all of these things in equal measure this is what relationships are about so in other words there's a point to a relationship and there is a practice of a relationship it's not just about being a good bloke you know right. it's you know it's a little bit like what we learned about collaboration the reason why most kids hate group work is because they're not taught how to do it right you know, it, all they're ever taught is it's good to be on a team yeah so and my, you know most teachers will like give them an initial you know, they'll teach them about the roles and forming, norming, storming and blah, 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 if they're lucky. And then they're thrown into a team. No one ever teaches kids about how to do conflict management. No one ever kids teach about doing principled negotiation. No one ever teaches people about doing evaluation um, of, of, of progress and reporting back and things like this. And funnily enough, that's because teachers don't like this stuff as well too. A lot of teachers don't like working in groups. They don't like evaluation and feedback necessarily. They're very good at getting... And we're frozen again. Yeah, got, yeah, I think you. I can hear you, but you're still frozen on the screen. Yeah, I think you're back now. Where did, where did, where did I get up to, mate? I lost you at uh, teachers don't like these things either. Yeah, so, so sometimes I think that the personality that is required to spend all day, every day working with kids comes with some ostensible strengths like compassion and um, patience and, and kindness and a willingness to help. But we're, I don't think necessarily it comes with a particularly robust growth mindset a lot of the time. And so we have to work with our strengths, but we also have to be very conscious about um, you know, what it is that we do. We did, we did an experiment early on when we were doing some leadership theory stuff and we put a group of teachers into a room um, and presented them with a scenario. So here's the scenario. You're working with a colleague, that colleague over several months has started to show signs of disengagement. Um, they're not meeting their deadlines, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do? When, you sit, when we sat the teachers down, they would go round and round the circle to do anything but have a conversation with that person directly and say, what's going on? Yeah. Whereas if you put a group of, if you put a group of um, sales executives from another industry in there, they're just itching to mm -hmm. get in there and sort it out straight away because they're motivated by an instant result, aren't they? Whereas, you know, schools, Schools are populated by people who treasure long-term relationships and, and love harmony. 
and um, love connection and, and, and so on. So I, I don't want to sound as though I'm disrespectful to my colleagues. I love my colleagues. So much respect for what they are and what they do. But I also think you should speak honestly. You know, there's something in Proverbs about that, speaking the truth I, I, in love, you know. So. Yeah, I'd want to, I want to add on to that as well because I, I think I sometimes get accused of the same thing. Um, and, you know, my position on that has always been the same for, well, even as a student in school, really, going as far back as I can remember. You know, respect, um, I think, is not characterized by um, avoiding the conflict and avoiding the challenge of pointing out <clears throat> areas for improvement and, and things. Um, I think that it is, or at least <laughs> I believe it when I do it, um, I think it's a sign of respect to have some of these conversations and to confront some of these weaknesses and to speak to teachers as individuals or as a profession about ways that we can improve um, and about areas that perhaps we're not doing as well as we can be. Uh, I get called out a lot for you know, being too negative and you know not focusing enough on all of the hard work that teachers do. Of course, teachers work hard. Um, I, I, at no point have I ever questioned that. And in a lot of cases, I think that teachers are expected to work harder than they should have to in a lot of ways. Um, but there is work. Or at, least, or, or at least harder at the wrong things. Well, that's exactly my point, I think. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, you know, there's a difference between working hard and working on what needs to be worked on. And I think that it is that that problem of being pulled in all of the directions um, by the various systems that we're a part of, uh, all of the directions away from what's best for the student in a lot of cases. And um, it's that that I, that I tend to focus on. Um, and it can sometimes look as being confrontational, um, but I certainly proceed with utmost respect for, for teachers around the world, um, as, as <clears throat> evidently you do. Um, so I wonder, no, there's, there's, there are a lot of things I want to come back to. There's a lot of things I want to move forward to as well. Um, so let's let's take a look at how all of that fits into the more international work that you do. Um, <clears throat> have you? How much do you find that these things, these ideas, are just universal? Because um, I think some of them clearly would be. Um, but also, how much do you have to adapt your work or your approach? to suit the various different cultures and systems and things that you're moving into when you work with uh, schools around the world? Um, so 98% of it is applicable just about anywhere. Good, um, I'm glad you said that. 90, it's, it's, it's like what we're dealing with here, it's human nature. Good, yeah. And, 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 and another area of conflict for me is I, I, I have quite a universal mindset about a lot of the things I talk about. Yeah. And, and there's a tendency at the moment to say, yeah. Um, oh, we have to do everything has to be minutely different for every different person that we work with. And I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't believe that. Yeah. You know, that's, I mean, that's just a, that's just a response to the quest for personalization, isn't it? And I think that, um, you know, we, we still haven't worked that one out. You know, I think the first time I talked with um, a school staff about differentiation and the fact that we needed to differentiate the curriculum in the senior school was in 2001. That school's still not differentiating, you know. You know, because we don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we if it's not connected to our sense of purpose, if, we, if it's not what we believe we want to be doing, then we won't do it. You yeah. know, and, and I think that, we don't understand the goals yeah. there as well. You know? Yeah, you know, and and saying we we don't want to do it, there might be a perfectly good reason why we don't want to do it. You know, it's just it's just where it is. I think um, you know, the 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 work of Robert Kagan and Lisa Lasco Lay is really influential with me helping me think about our colleagues. Um, when, when they talk about change management, they're, they're, they're at Harvard. Um, and uh, for them, it's simple. It's heart first, then head. And we are a profession that privileges the cognitive over the effective. Um, and a little bit like the world of economics before the Chicago School came along, they don't really know how to do that effective stuff. So we just kind of push it to one side. <laughs> and we go straight to the reason, you know, I think, um, I've done a thing. I've done a thing this year, but particularly the last two or three years now. I don't use PowerPoint at all anymore, and um, I've gradually abandoned it in the same way that I've abandoned my affection for examinations, because I just don't think, you know, PowerPoints are very, very good at providing a very detailed set of notes that completely disempower and disengage anybody from learning, because all you're doing is you're just saying, here's all the stuff, go and learn it, um, and of course that doesn't that doesn't change anyone's life. 
Mm -hmm. right? That doesn't transform anybody. What transforms somebody is that they develop a spark inside that leads them to ask a question of what might it be like if dot, dot, dot. And then they go and fill that in. And, you know, there's an intervention that they put in place in their own learning. You know, it's like all learning is action research. That's what it is. Um, and it's, you, you have to convince people that it's a good idea to do that. So, you know, increasingly what I'm working towards more is, is an environment where you just simply connect around a conversation and there are no props. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's no gadgets. There's nothing that gets in the way. It's not that gadgets are a bad thing, um, but it's more about it's what, what, it, what is our job? Our job is to persuade people to take the big step forward and up. And that's a really courageous thing that they've got to do and we have to be very kind to them along the way. Now, kindness might be clarity and it might be directness and a certain brusqueness. You know, you, you were talking about the internationalist, sort of the, the, the universalist. I, I do have that perspective, but, you know, th there are certain tweaks. You know, try going to Canada and doing work in Canada with Canadian teachers and not understanding about the importance of consensus. Right. You know, it's like it's it's a nation that's built around the idea. Now, whether it's always been built this way, I don't know. But right now, Canadians, you know, they don't like the they're, they're lovely people. And they don't like the idea of people being upset mm -hmm. around things. You know, try going and working with folk from Germany and beating around the bush mm -hmm. and doing this sort of. You're like, it's, it's pointless. You need to get into it straight away. That doesn't mean there isn't a human element to it, but you've got to get into it because they're trying to see the point yeah. of what you're doing and how you're doing it. Try go to work in Indonesia, you'd know all about this, without an appreciation for um, social hierarchy and social networks and how they work. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I remember going to Singapore the first time and doing some work and working with a colleague, it was uh, um, some colleagues and we were trying to work out whether we were gonna have relationships with each other and so on and so on. And there's this little old lady and, and, and you know, she's just, you know, um, just uh, sort of bustling around the room, making tea, sitting in the background and bringing people plates and so on and so on. And so on. You know, and we're having conversations about this, that, and the other. And I noticed that she was in every conversation and I was wondering, you know, is she the charwoman? Is, you know, is she the... No, she's the grandmother who actually owns everything and she was right. just there listening. For... Like, you know, and, and, and we didn't get anywhere until my mum came in the room <laughs> and that took, a bit, that took a bit of doing. And the two... Old women, of course, met for afternoon tea and then they came out arm in arm and told us, now you can do some work together. Yeah. Um, you know, if you didn't understand, like we didn't understand, you know, I'm, I'm useless on that sort of thing inherently. I've got, you know, you're going to bash me over the head several times before I learn those sorts of things. But, you know, it was, I think it was, uh, I said to you earlier about belonging, like somebody had to teach me those rules of belonging in that place. And if, as soon as you've got that right, then you can proceed to the next level. But if you don't get that right, the two percent will will shut you out forever. Yeah, you know. Yeah, good. No, I think so. I think it's, you you seem to take I think the same position as me. Uh, so just to check and to clarify uh, that you know I, I think I don't know I don't know I don't know you well enough yet, but I'm enjoying the conversation. That's good. It seems <laughs> that you 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 would agree perhaps that you know we can achieve some universal goals. But see, for me, it, it my experience has been. Um, the challenge is in kind of opening the door to that. The challenge is in getting people invested in the conversation in the first place. Um, and the cultural barriers seem to come at that point of getting them on board, getting them invested. Um, and at those points, at those early points, I found you have to incorporate the different cultural views and cultural mindsets, whether that's a national culture or an institutional culture. You have to kind of get the, you have to get that local, that community on board. Um, before you can achieve the goals that you're there to achieve, which might be quite radical by comparison to what they're used to and what they're familiar with. But I, my experience has been, you can get them there as long as you're kind of starting at the same place. And if you come in and say, you know, I don't know what you do and I don't care what you do because you need to do what I want you to do, um, that's never gonna achieve much, but you can go a long, long way from that starting point as long as you know where that starting point is. Yes. Good. <laughs> um, you mentioned exams, um, and this is something that I think is just a very long-term, ongoing debate. Mm. The English national pastime. Yeah, right. So I, 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 <laughs> I we will find a conclusion, but I don't know if we ever will. It seems like this this debate is just going to rage on for, for forever. Um, but I am interested because this is something I've come up against a bit lately. Uh, you are engaged in research. 
um, and you're also not a fan of exams. And one of the problems that I have had with a lot of research that I've um, that I've had to deal with in the last few years, especially, has been that often research into education is measured by its impact on exam scores. And because I'm no fan of exams, um, I'm no sort of proponent of these these this form of research that says, well, this is a good educational intervention. This is a good method because we saw exam results increase by X percent. Um, if, I, if I don't endorse the exams in the first place, I find it difficult to uh, endorse the research that's built upon them. So what's your, how does all of that fit together for you? How do you determine the, the, the effectiveness of the interventions that you're engaged in? Uh, how do you structure your research um, when you um, don't endorse the, the exam model? Okay, so I think the first thing to note is the, is the research by the Gates Foundation over recent years, which says that putting examination-based examination pedagogy and if you like, real pedagogy in opposition to each other is a false dichotomy. Yeah. Um, good teachers both teach to the test and teach about substance and teach about life and teach about the things that need to be done. So um, regardless of the situation about whether you believe in exams or not, um, good teachers do both. So this, this idea that some of our colleagues have, which is just simply about reject exams for their own sake. Well, there's a practical reality. If you're teaching in a, in a school and you're in an exam-based system, you better get some good exam results, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you're not teaching about life at the same time, then, you know, more for you, honestly, because you've got this wonderful opportunity in terms of the life of the, of the students in front of you, where you can teach them to contextualize and seek the relevance of it. I think where I've fallen out of examinations is just the, the reality that, you know, it's if all they are is a sorting device mm. to get you from this stage to the next stage, then number one, they are a very poor predictor yep. of future success. Right. They're only a predictor of success in examinations in a particular sort of way. Yep. So if life is going to be regulated by examination, so if I think about, for example, you know, the, historically the Mandarin system, where every step of the way involved taking examinations and so on and so on and so on, they're important. You know, um, it's if you look at what doctors have to do in their career and fellowships and things like that, where you know, if there's a particular type of assessment mode that's going to be used. You know, you better get good at it early because otherwise you're not going to be able to demonstrate your qualification. And we, you know, we need, we need doctors who are pretty good at doing things. But I can't imagine, for example, that, you know, my, my closest mate is, um, is, uh, is an anaesthetist. Um, an examination is good. I'd want to know whether or not he can do a lumbar puncture. You know, that's what I really want to know before, you know, that's, that, that seems to me to have some relevance. It's a little bit like... Uh, anything that we do, it's got to be done in context. Um, I can understand why um, uh, commercial pilots or air traffic controllers, you know, what you really want to do, I can understand why, why knowledge is important. Knowledge is very, very important, but so are skills, dispositions and learning habits and they need to be integrated together in a realistic context. I want to know someone can land a plane. That's what I want to know that they can do. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I don't want them to pass an exam around it. So I think the reason why I've fallen out of love with examinations is that we live in a world now where, number one, we just don't accept the premise that some people should have and some people should have not uh, on the basis of spurious, yeah. um, you know, social, socially... Opportunity giving all. Sorry, Phil, I've lost you there. I think you're back. Yeah, I'm back. Where did I get up to again, mate? I go back to the reason I've fallen out of exams. Yeah, look, as I said, the, the reason why I've fallen out of examinations is that um, uh, number one, if they if they if they're used as a sorting hat to determine who is going to have and who is going to have not it's just it's morally untenable it's an evil in society um you know it's it's 
we need a new social construct around education, which is based around the premise that what we're trying to do is provide opportunities for every person to thrive in the world. Not everybody is becoming a traffic controller. Not everyone's going to become an anaesthetist at the end of the day. But if examinations are designed to include some people and exclude others, no, no, I'm just not, I'm just not with it. You know, it's, we've, we've had the opportunity to start to design some rules around assessment of character and assessment for character and, and so on. Uh, and we've seen some of the things that have been done by other research institutes around the world, which is about more decontextualized, top-down, standardized testing, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. We're not going to do that. You know, it, 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 we, we believe, for example, that you, you definitely need evidence. You definitely need to assess character. But that data needs to be put into the hands of the person who's living the life. They're the ones who need to take the data and then they can warrant their practice around it. You know, they can, they can turn around and say, look, we've gathered this data. I've gone to this person, this person, this person, and this is what it looks like in practice. Now, this is what I think and demonstrate about myself. This is where I'm going around that. I think is morally defensible in our world today because it shows a respect for the dignity and worth of every human being. It also allows us to escape the trap of, um, you know, of, of, examinations which are not culturally informed and whether whether you believe in all of the the argument about you know the the degree to which there's cultural bias and, and implicit bias in all systems in education what you can do at the very least is is try and do things which 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 are clearly not going to not going to do that not going to influence that now at, at some point someone's got to start saying we don't want this and we're not going to do this so um, that's sort of where we are and that's where we stand around that. Um, if I was still in a classroom teaching, uh, you know, extension age and history for 17 year olds, my goodness, I'd be working hard at good exam results. But right. if I couldn't teach, Thucydides, if I couldn't teach Thucydides and take them to the quarry on the Sicilian expedition and watch the Athenians getting slaughtered um, uh, for the, for, you know, the, the folly of generals making poor decisions and populist governments fooling a population into, into pursuing, you know, untenable goals. Um, well, you know, there'd be something wrong with that too, wouldn't there? And, 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 and if ever there was a world that needed to learn about the folly of populist governments, it's our world right now. Yeah, I'll allow the, uh, the viewers to tease their metaphors out of there. <laughs> um, good, so what is some of the, the, the most current research that you're doing then? What are you working on right now? Sure, sure, so the stuff I'm really excited about now um, uh, it's about a framework for character development which is developmentally informed so I'm very interested in the ideas of what we should be informed by when we're trying to teach um, uh, uh, students the, the competencies they need to learn to live to lead and to work in the world um, you know what works for lower primary what works for upper primary what works for middle school what works for senior what works beyond what are the things we should be focusing on we've formed a view very much that that if you're not connecting learning to the notion of a life of purpose by the time students are, are 15 or so, you know, then you've got a problem because mm -hmm. that's the key thing in their life is they're trying to work out what should I be doing and why should I be doing it? Yeah. You know, and it, it might, it's a, some, some of them get it straight away. You'd be surprised how many dentists and engineers know from an early age that they want to be dentists and engineers, mm -hmm. but then there's a bunch of us, you know, who take a little longer to get there. But we know that purpose is really important. We know if we step it back and you know a bracket, we know that um, experience is more important at that point than purpose. You can't ask a twelve-year-old to develop a sense of purpose, but you can ask them to experience the world and to break joy's grape against their palate. To quote Keats in as many different ways as you can, with um, you know, with children who are the the the, the age lower than that, uh, you know, that sort of upper primary, you, like it's all about family, isn't it? It's all about family and laying um, that mastery of knowledge, skills, com uh, um, dispositions, you know, and values um, uh, and learning habits so that when they inevitably break away from their families in the, in the years that are just to follow, that they've got some sort of anchor around that. And before that, it's all about sense of self. Mm -hmm. like it's all about developing that notion that I am not the center of the universe, that there is something um, to be learned that is different from my existence. Now, if we don't frame teaching and learning in that respect, where we've, we've lost the plot. Yeah. Similarly, I'm, I'm very interested in this notion of how you assess around it. When we, we talk to teachers around the world, you know, 73% of 
of teachers said they wanted to incorporate assessments of a student's character, competency and wellness into what it was that they were doing. In fact, make it perhaps the overarching thing yeah. so that, you know, it's not just about the individual outcomes or the behaviours or the dot points on the syllabus. It's mm -hmm. about what, how does this point to the picture? They just didn't know how to do it. We don't have practice around that. So both of those are tantalising my thinking at the moment. I hope to be writing something about it um, uh, in January. I'm going to take a break over December, January, but I'm, I'm hoping to come back and pump something out in as short a format as possible. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested. One, one of the things about being a sort of a, uh, a rogue professor and, and, and educator is that I'm not beholden to peer referenced um, uh, publication. I'm not necessarily beholden to um, being published by publishers. Mm -hmm. um, although Adriano and I do have a little project going at the moment that we can't wait to share with some people down the track, but um, in that respect, but uh, I'm, I love the idea that you can do research and get it out there as fast as possible. So again, when, you know, when we're having that discussion um, over, over, over LinkedIn about, you know, ways in which you could think about doing immersion days and things like that, I can just throw something out there and go, there you go, there's some research where yeah. it is right now. No, I'm not gonna wait four years to put it through the publication mill by which time nobody will access it and so on and so on. There it is, it's out there. And yeah. uh, if, it, if, it, if you like it, tell me, if you don't like it, tell me. Right, because you know, I'd rather I'd rather I, fix I it. Think your swim um, factor, I think, is is pretty valuable because when you do go through all of the traditional channels, the reality, um, and there'll be people who disagree with me on this, but I'm quite convinced that the reality is, you know, very, very, very few, vanishingly few, um, practicing educators actually read any of that. Um, it's not the it's not the pipeline to the classroom. If you want if you want teachers to be reacting to the research and the work that you're doing. Um, then you know those those kind of ivory towers of research are not the not the place to be. I think. Um, so yeah, and and we have to find ways of getting that research into people's hands, exactly. and doing it in such a way when we're not being ideological about it. We need to respect the intelligence of people along the way in their education. Yes, we need to respond to people's conservatism. I think that's you know you, you you've got to you you've got to find a way to irritate people enough to sort of get them to ask questions about well, mate, what, what might happen if what might happen yeah. if yeah. you know that's a that's a pretty safe place but you know as 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 my colleague adriana would say you know that that needs to be done within a place of psychological safety um and you know it's my colleague leanne wilson who who, who who's very influential in my thinking around this sort of stuff it's got to come from within the heart of community so somehow when you when you're an outlier when you're an outsider and a bit of a rebel or a renegade or a rogue or a rebel or whatever, 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 whatever people, I guess, like us are, we need to understand that we've always got to try and find a way to connect with the center of the community, understanding that that center is probably quite different from us in temperament, in disposition, in yeah, that's right. a whole bunch of things. Yeah, good. I agree completely. Um, before we finish, maybe you want to, uh, Tell us a little bit about what you've had going on on your podcast recently uh, and maybe point people to, to a couple of episodes they might want to check out. Yeah, sure. So look, the, the, I, I think all I really want to do is say, go and, go and find us. On, we're on Apple and on SoundCloud and on Spotify and on Google Play, the Game Changers podcast. If you haven't heard us already, you'll recognize it because there are two idiots in, in pink and blue um, on the, um, you know, um, no, we're not idiots, really. Adriano is certainly not. He's an art teacher and very profound, very, very profound educator. And I'm just a bloke with a beard. But what we've been able to do is we've been able to harness a whole lot of voices from around the world, helping us to think through what it means to be a pioneer in education and to show the way forward for other people who are interested in doing in doing that. So, you know, we and we range from having school students to to professors of education, to um, uh, school leaders, to chalkies, to everybody in between. So we're really interested in that very broad notion of what an educator is. So that if you're listening and you really like it, you, you might say to yourself, well, what's that my thing again? What might happen if we did? What might happen those sorts of things? No, um, we like ourselves, we just did the week. We, we just did the um, Relearn Festival um, uh, and we were a podcast partner for that. And I think we pumped out, um, uh, we pumped out 26 podcasts in two weeks uh, around yeah. that. We've done 80 something through the, I don't know. We're just going to keep doing it. 
Go and check it out. If you yep. like what you see, if you like what you see, you know what to do. Good. The Game Changers podcast. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope people will go and check that out and um, uh, give their likes and subscribes and their reviews and their comments there yeah, yeah, yeah. as well as here. And uh, Phil, it's been a real pleasure. Carl, it's been heaps of fun. Thank you for indulging me and allowing an old man to talk way too long about stuff that I, I, I enjoy talking about. And uh, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that maybe we'll have you back. Uh, there's a couple of things that have come up today um, that we might we might dive deeper into in, in future episodes or, or perhaps on some other platforms. So yeah, that'd, that'd be interesting. That'd be interesting. I'd value the opportunity. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for what you're doing too. It's I, I, don't you, isn't this podcasting medium absolutely fantastic for just getting thinking yeah. out there of all different sorts? Um, you know, you got to take the rough with the smooth, and you know, I'm I'm sure that you there will be things I've said today that will irritate and upset listeners. As much as things that they might <laughs> that they might that they might agree with and that, that, that they might enjoy, um, but that's all that's all part of it. I'd, I think I'd rather I'd, I'd rather be part of this really exciting community that's out there with with helping people to think through what it is that they're doing, and you know just just pushing the envelope a little bit, or maybe more than a little bit on occasions. Quite yeah. fun, really. Yeah, absolutely. All right, brilliant. Uh, I hope to speak again very soon. Thanks a lot, Phil. Thanks, Carl.